I'm very honored to be here today. I'm Roxanne Swensel. I want to do something that I thought of after spending the morning here and watching people coming in and out of the museum here and realizing that um, we're here in this amazing place in the capital of this country and we're experiencing when we come into this building um, indigenous peoples of the Americas and um, a little bit of that world view um, is important to have. Um, so I want to do a prayer in our language just so that you can hear a different sound. I've been walking around and I hear, you know, foreign languages from Europe or from different places of the world, and it's cool. It's cool. But very, very few of us ever hear native languages from this country. And so I would like to just take a moment and just listen to the sound, because this is the sound of the people from this country, one of the little tribes. Ding a ying, nambi nabi toa, de he in da ove he ha ami. Nabi toa in wat si he ove mani. Kut da nambi wat si ha ki. Bing beer, zang beer, a con beer, hung beer, makoa nang so genuke. Enye had a opa, re wepi ping nang, ha tung ove to. Hamba i jung nacho ang in poet sima ye. Bare we repo. Ta kitty bo if he siki ami. Hera if he a king ami. Hera if he heggy ami. He rang ho ne ha po o winge, he walking pun di i, kut dawa ha di sigi on, kut dawa ha hera ho. So I just want you to hear something different than what you normally hear for a minute because I want us to take a journey together into a slightly different point of view. And it's um, an important point of view. Um, Every point of view of indigenous peoples is so valuable because it helps us get a bigger perspective of the world. So my story starts at Santa Clara Pueblo, which is located in northern New Mexico. It's a village, a tribal village. We were not relocated. Like many tribes in this country, we are in our homelands, which makes us very special in this time and age. Um, 30 years ago, I started a nonprofit called Flowering Tree Permaculture Institute. I was interested in the ideals of sustainability, and permaculture seemed to fit right into that. And I was excited to merge it with our cultural values. And so it's permaculture with a native Pueblo twist to it. I started it at my home, which I built. Um, here's a picture of it in the wintertime. Um, what we were doing there to start it was to try everything we could, um, methods of sustainability for the high desert. High desert region is a very hard place to do a lot of things in because you got short season for growing, you got freezing cold weather because it's high altitude, you got a desert so you get very little rainfall. So we got all of the hard things all put together. But we um, worked at creating a sustainable homestead. From what I learned by doing this, we, um, I merged together what this is about for us as Pueblo people. And for us, it's about community. And when we think about community, of course, we think about people. <laughs> but I want us to even though this is a picture about people, <laughs> I want us to think bigger. I want us to think about community as being everything that is in our environment, that goes all the animals and plants and even the air we breathe and the water. And I want us to think about how we fit into that environment. What is it, what place do we um, sit in, nestle in? And I'm not just talking about people again, I'm thinking about the whole ecosystem around us. So think about it in terms of you're one of the strands of a basket, 
and this basket has many strands. It's your relatives, it's your food, it's your air, it's your house, it's your whatever makes up your world. And all those pieces create the basket of your world. And um, if you think about it, the more diverse your world is, the more strands in the basket you have. The more strands in the basket you have, the stronger your basket is. And it's an interrelating basket. So everything is connected to each other. The tensions, the relationship between each strand is very, very important to the basket. And it creates a very beautiful world, or can. You get monocultures and mono cropping and mono anything, and you take away diversity, what happens to your basket? It gets really flimsy. So the whole point is to think about creating a very complex, diverse basket. Um, in permaculture, we talk a whole lot about pattern understanding, and I loved pattern understanding part of permaculture because it fit right in with an indigenous point of view. Indigenous peoples all over the world have seen the world in a pattern language. So it wasn't like just like abstract things that had nothing to do with anything else. It's about the way everything related to each other and moved together. And it kind of makes sense. When you look at the world, you see really basic patterns everywhere, from very small, minute spirals to very large, universal spirals, it's there around us if we open our eyes and start noticing it. It's there. Oops, sorry. Um, again, another pattern uh, picture of things that we may not necessarily see as patterns, but they're there. And this is a whole topic in itself, but the whole point is that we are in a universe that moves in certain patterns. And the more we flow with those patterns, or like those rivers, so to speak, um, we may walk in more harmony than if we're fighting against those patterns. If, you know, nature doesn't move in a straight line, why do we make everything straight lines in our human world? It's like we're constantly fighting nature. But, you know, as this building <laughs> was trying to promote a different way of being, you know, we start to think about how do we do things in a more pattern, natural way. Patterns happen no matter what. So even in this clear cutting <laughs> picture, you can see the pattern of a tree, which is very curious to me. But we can use it for good or for bad. And again, people all around the world have used it, indigenous peoples, not only in um, their, their life ways, but in the ways to show, to exemplify it, to, to tell the story of the patterns of their world, from buildings to pottery to artwork to the way you sustain yourself. <clears throat> and they're very useful. They can be very useful. And without knowing it, you know, a lot of the engineering and technological world uses those maybe without being realizing um, how they're using it. I love the uh, culvert picture because in that, they're using the spiral, which is that wonderful pattern that's everywhere, but it's actually a pattern of incredible strength. And they're using that spiral pattern to strengthen that. If it did not have those rings to it, it would collapse from weakness. If you think about every thread of the clothes you're wearing has fibers that are spun around each other. Those are spirals interlocking with each other, and it makes everything that we're wearing. I mean, things that we take for granted every day are patterns. Um, not only in... Um, uh, things we see, but sometimes things we not necessarily um, see, like the patterns of the wind, the way the seasons go and the sun rises and falls. All of these are patterns. And um, we, we've used them as human beings to help us live, but we also have disconnected from them, so we've forgotten. 
we've forgotten. And um, the whole point of pattern understanding, again, is to remember again. Remember that these are there. They're natural resources that are available to us all. You don't have to buy the sun. You don't have to buy the wind. They're there. And there's ways to use them in good ways. Here is showing, you know, wind, wind patterns, season patterns, fire patterns, water patterns. <laughs> All right. So we're going to focus on one of these patterns, which is farming. <laughs> and here are some examples of people, indigenous peoples around the world, using um, patterns in farming. Instead of, you know, getting on a big tractor and making rows because that's what you're supposed to do as a farmer, it's like indigenous peoples were part of a place. And being part of a place, being in the place, makes you aware that maybe the land isn't all flat and square. It has movement to it, it has angles, it has wind flowing through it and stuff. And those patterns make a very different, unique um, energy of that place. And so people have used those in, in farming and it's been actually very beautiful. Um, here's one of our fields um, that we're us using these days, and again, using patterning to slow water down. So when water moves across the ground in a straight line, it's very fast and it puddles at the end. You slow it down like a meandering river stream and it soaks in. And we, living in the high desert, really need it to soak in. So here's one method we did to um, soak it in. Another method we use is um, a grid garden. And so we mulch. Traditionally, we used rocks to mulch with because we don't have a lot of um, organic matter in the desert. So we do have rocks, and rocks can be mulched. Um, here, we can use straw or old plants material. And we don't just monocrop. As you can see, there's lots and lots of things in my garden. Um, just like people, we don't want to all be the same people. We, we want to interact. And this helps with pest control. You know, if you have one um, bug that really likes, hey, tomato plants, and they come in, that bug comes in and finds a tomato plant, but there's a squash right next to it. Well, and then there's a tomato plant way, way on the other side. It, it's not going to go to the other tomato plant because it has to go through all these other plants to get to it. Now, if there's just a field of tomato plants, woohoo! then you have all the bugs coming in and eating all the tomato plants because it's easy. It's easy picking. So pest control was diversity, not chemical poisons. So the whole point, again, is to pay attention. Pay attention to your environment. Be in place. Not everywhere is the same. Every place, every person, every tree is different. Notice it. Notice it. <clears throat> so one of the things that we do at Flowering Tree Permaculture Institute is we've been growing out our traditional native crops for about 30 years. And um, these crops are very, very, very special to us. Not just because they're rare, but because they evolved with the people. Um, this, because we are in our homeland still, thank goodness, um, these crops have adapted to the location. And I once um, came across this scientific um, article that said that it takes 20 generations for any species, any species, human, bug, corn, any species, 20 generations staying in one location for the DNA of that species to adapt to the location. Now, if you think about a plant, you get, you know, in 20 years of growing out that plant, it can, it can adapt to that location, but it takes 20 years of growing that plant out in a particular location for it to suddenly go, aha, I know the soil, I know the amount of water, I know the sunlight here. 
For humans, how long does that take? And I was thinking, oh my gosh, as a human seed, we Pueblo people of the Southwest were not relocated. We are an amazing species that is still adapted to our location. We haven't been relocated. I knew as a seed saver that these crops that I was saying, saving all these years, were precious because they were so adapted to our place and our people. Um, the shoe fits. Here's some of um, the crops that we grow. Here's our little seed bank. It has lots of different corns and beans and squash and melons and herbs and cotton and stuff like that in it. Now, as I'm spending years, you know, growing out these seeds, hoping that they stay alive and realizing, you know, they have to be grown out every so often because they do have a shelf life. And if we don't keep this going, um, we're going to lose these species. And we've lost so, so much already. And um, so I'm hanging on to what we got left. Okay, meantime, I'm looking around the community and I'm watching people um, getting sicker, getting fatter, getting depressed. Um, the health issue um, has been horrendous. Um, what we put into our mouths, what we do in our lives uh, has changed us. And in the last 50 years, among most tribes, all tribes actually, um, the health has uh, gone down so drastically. Um, it kind of hit home uh, about eight years ago when my, one of my grandsons, who was six years old, was diagnosed with prediabetes. At six years old. That shouldn't happen. That shouldn't happen. So I'm desperate. Here I am going, okay, we have to do something. It really, really matters. How do we make our, our communities healthy again? And um, my son is a historian, and him and me were looking at old photographs because we were going to do some, um, some stuff in the, the traditional um, ceremonial world, and we were looking at some old photographs. And we were the further back the photographs went, the healthier we looked. We were like, wow, we used to be pretty handsome, nice-looking people, and the closer you got to modern times, the worse we looked. And I was like, oh, my gosh, what happened to us? So we decided, you know, it's not just the lifestyle, it's what we're putting in our mouth. So my son and me, we decided to try something out. Um, he was diagnosed with some heart issues because he weighed over 260 pounds, and they told him if he didn't change his diet, they would, um, he would be heading for a heart attack. Um, we decided we were going to try to see if we could eat our original foods, that means before European contact in today's time. Now, given that we have uh, strayed a long way from that, we still had some claws back in our history, and we wanted to really um, see if this could happen. Um, some of the information we were getting was that this was not just in our own tribal group. It was across the country. Um, native tribes were suffering the same way, and the worst of any tribal, any group of people, any racial group, we were having the worst time. And um, it goes back to that 20 generation thing. It's like, here we are in our country, but we've been eating food as if we're traveling Europe and Africa for the last 50 years. And we are really not adapted to our en stomach enzymes. Our body is not adapted to foreign food. We have not been eating it for 20 generations yet. So, so my son went to the doctors. And of course, the nutritionist comes in and says, OK, you're not healthy. You're supposed to eat like this. And we're looking at that nutritional pyramid that you all know about. And he was going, isn't it interesting? Nothing in this pyramid that they're telling us to eat comes from this continent. It's all foreign food to us. 
So we're trying to think, what's our pyramid? What's our native pyramid? And for us in the Southwest, as Pueblo people, it would be a pre-contact, pre-Spanish, in our case, um, uh, foods. And you know, some of it we still have, but other things we actually had to go to archaeologists to find all the way back to our ancestral roots and find what our ancestors were eating in the in the in the waste mittens and and places and be willing to get our feet dirty <laughs> to to really try this out so um we got a group of volunteers from the Pueblo, from the tribe, and um, neighboring tribes to agree to eat only our pre-contact food for three months. But first, we're going to test ourselves for sure. So we all went in for our blood tests and got weighed and prodded and poked by the doctors. Um, we came back with horrible, horrible... <laughs> Diagnosis of from age six years old to 65 years old, we had everything from heart disease to diabetes to obesity to depression to high cholesterol to um, all kinds of inflammation problems. We were a mess. But we held hands and we went into this diet for three months. Uh, we ate together. We shared the knowledge we were, we were getting, where to get the foods, how to prepare them. And uh, we, um, we stayed close together. <laughs> the foods were a big thing. We were relearning something that um, was ours, but we had lost. And we were bringing it back on a cold turkey level. Some of the foods were very foreign to us that we weren't used to, but we, you know, hey, <laughs> we were going to try everything. Uh, Grasshoppers were abundant in those, um, those years. We have these grasshopper plagues that come through, and everybody hates them. But trying to change the mentality to go, no, it's a gift. We get to eat grasshoppers for this year. Um, I turned them because people don't really want to look at a bug when they eat one. So I figured out how to turn it into flour. That's me standing there with my very proud jar of grasshopper flour, which you can add to your tortillas, your soups, or just scoop it out and eat it. Completely protein. It's a beautiful drink that's made out of cactus fruits that you can dehydrate and then rehydrate into. What I call this Indian Kool-Aid. Other things, just the beautiful amounts of corns, the different varieties that we you know, we were learning about uh, gathered things. To the right, you could see wild, some of our wild tea and pinyon nuts and different things we can harvest for snacks. And we forget things such as um, uh, how food comes to us and what it does to us to collect it in different ways. It changes when you have to find food that you can't find in a grocery store. We would laugh because we would go up and down the aisles, and you know what we'd find? Wheat, sugar, beef, chicken, and pork. <laughs> and none of those were on our diet. And it's different forms of that. You go up and down the store, and that's what you find. I realize that. And, and maybe you finally get over to the vegetable area, and you find some squash you can take home with you. <laughs> But otherwise, we had to make it ourselves. So it was starting to, food was leading us back to a life way that we also were, was losing. And it was helping us find those life ways again. One of them is the farming. And what you do once you get a crop in, we're having to go on well, now that we got some corn, how do we use it? Um, now that we got some beans, how do we use it? All of these things start to come into play again. And we have to relearn these methods. And not just in the, the growing uh, crops, harvesting them, but also um, in the animal world too. Like what were the animals we were eating? 
Um, we did, you know, we weren't eating processed beef or corn or, I mean, um, the chicken and, and pork. We were eating wild game like buffalo, elk, rabbit, turkey, rats. The group and us um, harvested three buffalo during our time that we were doing this uh, three-month uh, cycle, and it actually, one buffalo fed 14 families for a year. That's a lot of, lot of meat for off of one animal. And the thing about it is that it came with a story. And every buffalo we got during this time um, was a big, big event that we all talked about for, still talk about, and cry over and appreciate, like you couldn't ever get to if you went and bought, you know, packaged meat from the store. Um, when we went and got our buffaloes, it was a big, big deal. Here's, in this picture, we're butchering uh, the third buffalo we got, and these guys were um, recovering alcoholics, and they were very depressed and stuff, but we had asked them, uh, can you come help us get a buffalo for the community? And they were so excited to be important because they had, you know, lost themselves into alcohol because nobody, they didn't matter anymore. But we knew that they, they, they could do this. They were so amazing at doing this job and so proud to, to feed the community. And so, you know, bringing people together is, is super important. Um, not just the animals, but in gathering in the environment, learning to find food in the hills and the arroyos and the, and the valleys was really, has been an amazing journey to relearn what's right there in your own backyard. We forget about things like condiments. <laughs> when you don't have like ketchup to put on your <laughs> french fries, um, we, were very caught that our people use salt. And, and traditionally, we had always heard that the salt mother was a big, big deal. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's nice. <laughs> but when we were eating this way for those three months, cold turkey, nothing else, oh, my God, salt was an amazing, amazing thing. And we realized that, yeah, we could go buy salt in a store, but where did we originally get our salt? So we actually went to go find our original salt source out in the desert. And that became a whole journey and story of uh, re, uh, reconnecting with our salt mother and, um, and what that was like to go actually gather it, process it, think it, and use it. Differences in cooking was um, a big thing. You know, it brings back things like um, what were we cooking it in? How were we cooking it in? Uh, no frying. We don't have bottles of olive oil. We don't have a lot of those things. We live in a high desert, so it's very dry. We dry everything, and then we seem to rehydrate it where we need it or eat it dry. And I realized you could dry anything in the desert, and it'll keep forever. You don't need a refrigerator. Ta-da! I have to I have to comment on the the bowl with the with the two different things in it. The the thing to the right of it is zucchini, and realize that you don't have to even cook a zucchini. You could cut it in thin slices and dry it, and they're like potato chips. Halloween became a very different sort of thing. <laughs> We're trying to figure out all the things. I forgot what the one on the left is, but there's popcorn, pinion nuts, quail eggs, a trail mix made out of currants and pumpkin seed and pine nuts. Very, very good. All right, after three months, we all went back to the doctors, got poked and prodded, prodded and uh, blood tests done. And um, this is my son. Um, he's one of the big losers. <laughs> he had lost uh, uh, a whole lot of weight, and his uh, blood tests were really good. 
Uh, we had three other people that had lost almost 100 pounds. And everybody, everybody in the group had improved in whatever um, uh, health issues they were in, had improved completely. Uh, we had proven without a doubt that the shoe fit, our foods did fit our bodies, and uh, we started to really um, tell the world because we knew that Indian country needed to do this for themselves, and not only Indian country, but all peoples. Because at this point, we're all in a pretty bad condition of, um, of processed foods that aren't good for us. And so I encourage, encourage the world to find their roots. Not necessarily to eat our food, because you're not Pueblo Indians, but to find your roots where you were last in one place for 20 generations. I bet your food would do to you what ours did to us. So walking forward, um, we keep learning. Um, this has been an ongoing process because that first test group that we did that we proved to ourselves in the world that this really works was um, over five years ago. And since then, we have been learning more traditional methods of how we actually cooked this, these foods. And a part of that has led us to um, making um, a women's cooking house in the Pueblo. And that brings in the whole style of traditional building, which has been great fun in bringing back this traditional knowledge of building with adobe dry mud. So here we are mixing mud, making adobe bricks, and building walls, floors, roofs over our heads, all for our cooking stones and our grinding stones. and putting back many, many traditions that were connected to food. Remember the basket. We're doing other cookie um, building methods of building these uh, ornos, or we call them bantes in, in our language, um, for cooking in. Here's babies building. <laughs> Here's us cooking some corn in one of the ovens. So when you get a large batch of corn, for instance, coming in from the field, you know, you don't, you need a big oven. So you f just fill it up with a lot of corn to roast. And then, of course, we dry it. And that corn then can be used for uh, the next hundred years in soups. Oops, sorry. It also is bringing back different ways of of drying and taking care of things. And going back to the seed bank, it's also bringing back ideals of how do we take care of our seeds traditionally. So we do classes on seed pots, digging clays out of the earth where we used to dig and, um, and creating vessels to, to not only save the seeds in, but to cook. Finding, finding some, some, uh, high technical <laughs> methods of uh, processing food. This is my kitchen, by the way. And again, this is about relationship. It's reconnecting ourselves with our food. How many of us know where our lunch came from besides the counter at the restaurant? or the grocery store down the street? How many of us know the whole story behind that sandwich you ate? The lettuce, the meat, the bread. We've disconnected so far that we don't even have a story, we just have a sandwich. What happens when we start adding back the story to the sandwich? It becomes bigger than a sandwich. It becomes a whole history, a whole life way, a meaning that is deeper than, oh, I had lunch. It starts to put our weaving of our basket back together to add these stories. 
For us, it, to me, every piece of the basket I put back puts back a community. And more strands in that community, the stronger our communities become, and the more sustainable we become together. Um, part of our outreach has been to um, educate people on what we've been doing and um, how we're doing it to inspire and um, keep this going. Um, one of the things we did do with our, with our group is create the cookbook that you actually, I saw in the bookstore here, um, about the foods we ate during our trial time and that are our original foods. And it was just put together by the group and what we were eating during that time with some stories that, um, that we had available to it. But the whole point is to inspire, to get us back on track because we've disconnected tremendously, every single one of us, from our food, our place, our heritage, who we are. And I think it's a long journey home for all of us, but we can do it. We've started here at Santa Clara, all of us can do this. And of course, we need to go back so that we can have a future. Because where we're heading now is a brick wall, but I think we can find our way to a future if we return back to ways that were good for us. Okay, thank you. Yes. I'll take any questions if anyone has any. Any questions? Here. Um Okay. Hello. Yes. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, how much has this grown since the initial, the initial group that did the three-month trial? Um, it's grown by way of like, we, we, did, we actually documented this process, and, and we made a little DVD out, out of it, and I sent out 500 copies to tribes around the country to get, to inspire them to do the same in their place. And I do believe since we... Um, uh, started this that we inspired other tribal people to start looking at their own um, food traditions and the movement around food sovereignty has gotten huge lately and that I like to think that we were a large part of that and so I think that's grown um, within our own little community um, we're working now with farmers and with trying to to get the food, um, now that we know the food is where we need to go, we got to get the food more available to the community. So we're working right now on getting that food grown out more and processed to be available. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. You're, 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 Except the, oh no no I'm not doing I I have enough of a voice. Uh, yeah. I, oh. 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 <laughs> so, twenty generations we're not eating anything we're supposed to be eating. All right, I'm Irish and Lithuanian, uh, and uh, so we came up potato famine. So that's 1860. So now I'm eating processed food and everything. I can't go back there and do that. Here our seeds are all modified sprayed with Roundup. There's nothing healthy. I'd rather eat the European outdated food than I do the American food. I hear you. <laughs> I was talking to an Italian woman who, who said that, you know, she's been eating, she, she grew up eating pasta and she lives in the United States and um, she's sick all the time. She has all these problems. She goes home to Italy, eats pasta for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and she loses 20 pounds right away and feels a lot better. It's the wheat. We've messed up our wheat.
Um, hello. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It's very uh, inspirational. Um, I'm Pacific Islander, um, and I know that in some Pacific Islander communities, they live in food deserts. So they don't. Not only do they not have access to like, you know, indigenous foods, they don't have access to healthy foods in general. They don't have access to vegetables, so they're they're stuck eating like you know hot Cheetos or you know really processed food. So do you have any advice on other um, indigenous communities that are like far away from home on how they could like bring back uh, those uh, indigenous practices of like farming and like getting access to healthy food? Um, hopefully there's, I always tell people, find what that environment, because we're all indigenous to this earth somewhere. Wherever that is, find out where, what was growing, what was walking around, what was eaten and done there before humans messed it up <laughs> and find out what you know was was available there piece it back one piece at a time i was down in the havasupai canyon of the grand canyon the tribal people there you think that they would be so intact as a community but the government started giving them money stipends and so now all they want to do is wait for the helicopter to fly them to phoenix so they can go to walmart and they're Health is tremendously bad. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, you have this beautiful, beautiful canyon. Find some seeds that are left. You know, even if it's just one person do one field and, and then start spreading it. And, and I'm sure that you can find the next closest thing. Like for us, you know, strawberries, for instance, is on our diet. But those strawberries come out of California that are this big, are, are not the same as those little mountain strawberries. But we're like going, okay, we're going to start with these strawberries, but we got to go back to when strawberries had anything to them. One step at a time. And for, you know, granted, we've made a mess everywhere, but we can find pieces left. And let's start grabbing those pieces and putting them back together. Um, my name is Tishina Parker, and um, I come from Yosemite. My grandmother um, is has is known for basketry and acorn, and I've eaten traditional foods since I was young. And I also have been to your house, I, or your place in New Mexico in Santa Clara with Dancing Earth. Mm. And we happen to be here performing for um, the Smithsonian, or not Smithsonian, sorry, the Kennedy Center. And we performed... Um, a work that I believe is really based and inspired by your work and the traditions of where we come from, our, how we're connected, our spirit is connected to food and our cultures are connected to food. So I wanna say thank you for that. And um, it's kind of amazing to be here and see all these things tie together. Yeah. And then also the hoop dancer who, is a, who mentioned my good friend Sage. So it's all, we're all the way across the country and just seeing the connections is amazing. Yeah. Um, and I also want just a comment on, on food to everybody here. Um, there's a really great book called Eating on the Wild Side, mm -hmm. which teaches you, if you don't farm and you live in an urban area, it teaches you how to pick varieties within the grocery store that are most closely related to their wild varieties mm -hmm. and get the foods that have the most nutrients out of the ones that have been farmed for many generations. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also as well, like there are communities who are rebuilding um, sorry. Okay. <laughs> there are communities who are rebuilding skills within your area. I know in New Mexico and in California, Colorado, all over the place that are teaching these traditional skills that we all knew as indigenous peoples, how to process animals, yeah. how to grow and cultivate food, how to make cooking vessels and all this stuff. So I, I, I see yeah. it all connecting and coming back and the information is out there and you just have to want to be curious and, um, Find, find it. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, and say hello to Roland. <laughs> thank you, I will. <laughs> I think we have one more question here. Um, so my question, you touched on this a little bit. In terms of starting up your seed banks again, you know, that was a big process for you guys. I remember you mentioning you even had to reach out maybe to some archaeologists. And so, you know, the strawberries, eventually you're trying to work back to your original strawberry seeds. Um, 
how what was that process of being able to start from scratch basically and then build up um, your seed banks to where they are now? Uh, it's been 30 years. <laughs> so, you know, the, but, but now we know kind of where we're trying to head for. So that's helpful. Maybe we could speed this up for all of us, um, knowing that, no, we don't want to keep going down the path we've been going because we, we know what it leads to, a very unhealthy society, health. Um, uh, so one piece at a time. I always tell people, start small. It's better, you know, to just find one thing and keep it going and then add another thing and keep it going and see if, you know, do it where it sustains itself. You know, if you get too big, I always tell people, don't go plant a big field. You won't ever get out there and weed it because it's too big. Start little and then you'll get excited. It keeps the momentum. Only grow as much as you can have energy to keep going, but do it, do it, do it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for being here, and I want to thank Roxanne. Where are you here? Come up here. Um, please check out her artwork in front of the museum, uh, in front of the theater when you leave. It's gorgeous. It's one of our pride and joy. So it's such an honor to have you here. Thank you so much. And thank you guys. Enjoy the rest of the day. We have lots going on still. Thank you.